In this lecture, we discuss one of sexual citizens' three key concepts, sexual geographies. This includes defining it and then sharing an example from the book about how it's useful to understand both sex and sexual assault on campus. Uh, we also do something which we don't do in the book, which is to step back a little bit and situate the idea in relation to social theory. Um, before I start, I just want to give a content warning. Um, as in the book, we describe sexual assaults as students recounted them to us. So this material can be hard to hear. It was hard for us to hear. And of course, harder even for many of the students to live. If you need to take a break while you're listening, of course, do so. And if you want someone to call, the RAIN hotline is 1-800-656-HOPE. That's 1-800-656-4673. In every room, whether virtual or real, there are always survivors. And um, please know that you're never alone. So sexual geography. Um, we'll start with a very specific example. So any campus dorm room that you walk into, back in the world when people walked into campus dorm rooms, um, had four pieces of furniture. There is a desk, a desk chair, a dresser, and a bed. And so think for a moment about two young people who want to be together. Um, someone says, you want to go back to my room? They go back to the room. Then in that room, they really can pretty much only sit on the bed. If you sit, you go into a room and you sit in someone's desk chair, it's a little bit like, what is wrong with you? And yet bed have sexual meetings. And um, so the situation funnels them towards, um, towards a, a, um, a context in which it is hard not to misunderstand what is going on. And so more generally, our work highlights the importance of geography on campus. And by that, we mean things like furniture, but also so much more. Sexual geographies are the spatial context through which people move and um, the ways in which the, uh, those spatial contexts are controlled by friends and organizations that can regulate access to those spaces. So think about space not just as a backdrop, like this is not like a play where the space is the thing behind the actors, but it is actually in some ways an actor itself. Um, this draws on a long tradition of scholarship that shows how space elicits and produces behavior. Um, and this realization comes with an opportunity. Schools can reorganize spaces in ways that make sexual assault less likely to happen. Um, so think about space, the myriad ways in which on campus and beyond, access to and control over space is a manifestation of power. So sexual geography as an idea it is inherently also about social power. And of course, that's important because power is essential to understanding assault. The campus sexual geography is shaped by the taken for granted assumption that more advanced students should enjoy housing with more social space in single bedrooms um, on some campuses by national Greek life policies that ban sororities, women controlled spaces from hosting parties that serve alcohol, which effectively gives men control over party spaces and the distribution of alcohol. So these spatial dynamics, control, access, feeling at ease, are major players in sexual assault. And those who control the space may not even be aware of how that tilts power dynamics in their favor. So an example. Um, charisma um, was not finding a lot of people on campus that she was interested in, in, in being with. She, Eventually, uh, she was a um, woman of color from the southwestern United States. Um, she uh, met a guy, friend of a friend. They were texting. Um, he, seemed, he seemed interesting. And so uh, she made a plan to go visit him at his apartment off campus in Brooklyn. Um, sort of from the beginning, as she, were, like, looked, as she looked back on the evening, she was like, it, this was, it was going to be a disaster. Um, it was raining. The subways weren't working. Um, she had trouble finding his apartment. Miraculously, she actually had his phone number written down on a little piece of paper. And so she called him from, from a bodega and he went to go find her and she got to his apartment. She was soaking wet. Um, really all she wanted to do was just peel off her socks and shoes. Um, so she dried off. Um, 
they uh, did a couple shots, they smoked a joint, they were watching TV. It seemed like it was fine for a while um, until it wasn't fine. So Charisma and this man are hanging out together in his apartment in Brooklyn. And it's important to know that Brooklyn, you know, it's in New York City, but it takes on public transportation almost an hour to get there from Morningside Heights, where Columbia and Barnard campuses are located. And, you know, as they've smoked this joint, um, they, they start to make out a bit and she's into it. She's, Charisma's fine with that. And then he starts to put her hands in places where Charisma's not really comfortable. And she uh, moves his hand away and he persists. And as Charisma tells this story, she says to us, you know, um, I never really had a plan B. Her plan A, her way of dealing with men and and their sexual advances was to use body language. But the man that she was with didn't respond to either willfully ignored or, you know, simply tried to work around in his perspective, perhaps her body language of what it was that she wanted. And um, he ended up assaulting her uh, um, uh, from our interpretation of the story, raping her where she didn't want to have sex. Actually at one point in time, while um, um, they were having penetrative sex, she expressed discomfort and said no. And he continued. Now, how do we make sense of this with the concept of uh, sexual geographies? Well, there are many ways in which the geography of campus life influenced the experiences that Charisma had. The first is to think about campus as a racialized space. One of the reasons why Charisma was out there in Brooklyn with this guy was because she didn't find a place on campus life that she felt comfortable with. she described campus as many students of color did as a white space. And to her, this meant that the musics and party, the, the music that students listened to and the parties that they were at, they just weren't for her. She didn't like the kind of drinking that was happening. She thought of that as a sort of a kind of white practice, as we show that it is in the book as well, that wasn't really, didn't speak to her experiences or her desires. And she found that the white students on campus, like they didn't find her attractive. They weren't as interested in her And so, you know, she ends up leaving campus space in part because of the ways in which it's racialized. So that shows how campus geographies can be racial. The other way to think about this is class and how access to and control over space and the ability not just to enter space, but to exit space is sort of economically influenced. So other students on Columbia's campus could have opened up their phone, called an Uber, and got out of that apartment in Brooklyn if they wanted to. But Charisma couldn't do that. Um, You know, the subway that she'd gotten to go to Brooklyn was running incredibly slowly. It would have taken her over two hours to get home. It was actually really difficult for her to leave in a way. It wasn't impossible, but it was difficult in a way that it wouldn't have been for other students. And so where Charisma was, you know, comparatively trapped in this space, other students wouldn't have been able to leave quite easily because they had the economic resources to do so. And I also think that there's something, we, well, we also think, excuse me, that there's something gendered about this, um, about you know, the fact that a lot of sexual encounters happen in contexts where men control the spaces. And so in Charisma's case, you know, she was in an, an apartment that was controlled by this man. And um, I, there were ways in which her experience of this, her not having a plan B, was deeply tied to gender. So, you know, this idea that space elicits behaviors, what Jennifer said at the very beginning, is something that has deep roots within social theory. It doesn't just have to do with sex. You could think for a moment yourself about how you act differently in different spatial contexts. If you're in a religious space or a party space, or sitting at the dinner table with your parents, those spaces make different kinds of action possible. And this means that space isn't just, as Jennifer said, a backdrop, it's a critical actor. It elicits or produces particular kinds of interactions and likely behaviors. In this sense, we think about space as a principal component of sexuality, as something that constitutes sexuality. So to be in particular kinds of spaces is to be in areas that are more or less likely to elicit 
sexual encounters or sexual experiences. And importantly, all spaces reflect social power. So as Jennifer said in the beginning, you know, think for example about campuses that have fraternity and sorority life. Fraternity and sorority life exists in such a way that men are allowed to serve alcohol and women aren't. And so access to space and control over space is deeply gendered. Or in contexts where, you know, if you want to be able to have not just beer, but say a mixed drink, you have to enter into a private space that someone else controls on a fraternity. This shows the ways in which space reflects a range of social power, be that the power of whiteness, the power of class, the power of gender inequalities. And this intersectional lens about space and power and the multiple dynamics of campus life become essential for understanding how and why it is that sexual assault uh, happened. Finally, the reason we focus so much on space isn't just because it's deeply explanatory for what it is that happens, that is, the ways in which space helps produce particular kinds of behaviors. It's also modifiable. So think about all of the campus policies, either formal or informal, that empower some students and disempower others. We naturalize the ways in which more senior students have access to better space. But that in some ways augments power inequalities on campus. Senior students who already know so much about how campus works, who already have existing friend networks, who have you know, years of experience which empowers them are further empowered by their control of better space. And so we might all think, how could we redesign campus life and all kinds of physical and geographic spaces in general in order to transform or modify the environment in order to prevent sexual assaults before they happen.